أجمعين بعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين لا سيما بقية الله في الأراضين روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مختمه الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these sessions and we hope that the communities continue to pursue these important issues and we should know that it's not something that uh, we can have a one time a series of talks and discussions and leave it. We are in constant need uh, to hear and to be reminded and to remind each other of these important concepts and as we move forward with developing our children, our next generation, and during the process of that development, we need to hear things, and we need to discuss things, and we need to talk about things. If we know something, we need to share it with others. It helps us, and uh, hearing it from others is a good reminder. So it's, because it's, as we said, a, an extension of prophethood, the Qur'an mentions many, many, many times that there needs to be reminders. The prophets are reminded, God reminds His prophets, and they remind us, they remind, they brought reminders when they were with the people. There's plenty of reminders if you look at the ahadith, if you look at the verses of the Qur'an. So we need those reminders as parents. We need to constantly be reminded of these things. It's not a one-time thing. So I, I hope that, inshallah, uh, sisters continue looking into these matters and uh, reminding themselves through the verses of the Qur'an, through whatever means they can. Other talks, other, I guess, lecturers or whatever, asking them, requesting them to, to give their understanding inshallah so today's session is supposed to be for I think the more, more difficult part of a parenting which is well it's titled 14 through 21 uh, as I said before I don't think a 21 year old is really under too much influence from parents any longer they shouldn't be actually um, they should have already obtained what they needed and what they required from the parents and uh, from that point onwards in their late teens to be able to be independent and for the parents to be able to look at the product and the result of their work and, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they have been granted. So I'm not sure if we can say, as I said before as well, those very particular timelines. Uh, my experience and also my understanding of the verses of hadith is not that those timelines are uh, what we should be too concerned about. <clears throat> but uh, generally speaking, around the age of 14, a little before, a little after, those are very, very crucial, very uh, important years, very delicate, very difficult years at the same time. Now, I haven't dealt with it as a parent uh, yet too much. My daughter's 13. We're I guess just starting in that process. Mm. What I have dealt with is mainly, well, all of us have the experience of, of going through those years. But besides that, uh, dealing with children of those ages and parents that are dealing with those uh, children of those ages, as well as then what we see in the verses and the ahadith with all of that observation put together uh, trying to come up with an understanding <clears throat> 
obviously, as we mentioned yesterday as well in the first day, the, uh, what we are going to be doing as parents, continuing with the work of prophets, is ta'lim and tazkiyah, to provide knowledge and to do tazkiyah. In the last session, I focused more on ta'lim and information that needs to be given. Uh, and I didn't talk too much, we didn't get time to talk too much about tazkiyah for the ages of 7 through 14. <clears throat> so what I want to do today is to talk more about tazkiyah, which will apply to uh, the ages of 7 through 14 as well as 14 through 21. I want to address that a bit more. And with that we need to establish a couple of principles uh, which are important. If we don't get those straight then we're not going to uh, be able to really uh, get to the practical aspects. I've emphasized before, I'm not sure how much in these sessions, uh, many times people look for very particular practical instructions or guidelines as to how to do certain things or what needs to be done practically which is fine however what's more important is the the knowledge base or the the background of that the the foundations for it theoretically and in our minds in our thought process that needs need to change our perspective needs to be correct on things. If we correct our perspective, that will naturally lead to a different set of practices and behaviors. And if that's not there, even if particular instructions are given because the approach and the perspective isn't right, then you're having perhaps some of those practical parameters put in, but that is in the midst of a whole bunch of other stuff that happened in the house or as parents that we deal with our children uh, that those other things are not going to allow those very particular practical steps to have the effect and the benefit that they should so changing or correcting our perspective having the correct perspective on things is, is very important I'll start with this The process of tazkiyah, which we said, let me remind us, we said tazkiyah is to remove uh, or remove the, the qualities, the negative qualities that lead to negative behavior, wrong behavior, and also creating good qualities within a person uh, that lead to good behavior, the internal element, the soul being purified. Otherwise, you can have good behavior presented, but it could be hypocrisy, and that's one of the worst things you could ever have. If you act or behave a certain way, but the reason for it is not the good reason, that would be a good reason, that would be hypocrisy. You don't really believe in it, you don't really want it, you're, tr you're trying to show a particular face. So what's, what Tezkiah was, was to clear that up. However, the method of doing it, the way we're going to get there, the way we can clear those things up are through our or is through our behavior. Correcting our behavior is going to lead to correcting those illnesses within. We can't cure the illnesses without dealing with the symptoms. Okay? Those, uh, the outward behavior needs to be treated and dealt with. If it is treated and dealt with, Gradually, it will lead to the purification of the soul. So, tazkiyah was the purification of the soul. What we're stressing is, to get there, we need to correct behavior. The behavior that is seen, if it is corrected, eventually it will lead to the correction or the purification of the soul. More specifically, if we were to put that out, using a few other religious uh, terms that we have in the Qur'an and in the Ahadith,
what is referred to as taqwa that's what leads to tazkiyah that's what causes tazkiyah that's what causes a person a person's soul to be purified taqwa sometimes is translated or explained as and you might or probably have heard this from various sources as doing your wajibat in a way avoiding uh, haram which isn't wrong uh, however the actual meaning of taqwa itself literally is to be careful with your deeds to be cautious to have care to worry about what you do and check it okay make sure what you're doing is right if we pay close attention we will see there's a difference between the two what we actually end up doing and the internal process of making that decision are two different things we may try our best and we may uh, be careful with what we want to do we are careful we are mindful but sometimes end up failing at it okay we may end up doing what is actually not right okay what we are told and this is very important what we are told needs to happen that leads to purification is taqwa itself meaning that spirit within us that cares about what I do and what I don't being careful of the deeds is most important having that concern in our minds in our hearts about what we do is most important okay this is understanding the process itself the process of tazkiyah the process of tazkiyah to get to where our souls are purified is to have that internal concern and worry about what I do and I, what I don't what I leave and what I take if I'm concerned about that I will start to do better things and leave things that are not good but at the beginning I'm not going to be too perfect at it if I continue with that care being concerned I will continue to make progress in terms of uh, doing the right things and avoiding the wrong things and when that continues continuity being key it leads to purifying it leads to getting rid of the illnesses within I hope that um, I'm able to explain this further in, when we get to the parenting part. First, we want to establish that principle that that's the method of purification. Before anything else, before we get to the uh, parenting part of it, uh, I'm going to mention something that is related to it, but it may not be seen as such. <clears throat> and in a sense, it isn't. It, it is independent, but it is related as well. And that is, we need to be involved in the process of tazkiyah. Okay. If you look at, again, going back to the principle that was established on the first day, parenting is a continuation of, it's an extension of prophethood. We are continuing that. The prophets were themselves, first and foremost, muzakka. They were implementing these teachings themselves. They had purified themselves first, then they started purifying others. Of course, their level of purification was at a much, much higher level, but that's just how it works. In order to be able to train others, you need to be purified yourself. If you're not purified, you can't train others. So, we ourselves, even if we're not parents, we need to be involved in this. That's the main goal of religion. Uh, but also if we are concerned about our offspring and our next generation from that perspective as well we need to take it that much more seriously that should be another incentive for us to be more involved 
to take it more seriously and to think of our shortcomings, again, that care about our actions, our behavior, what we do and what we decide not to do. If we have that care, we will follow up. We will be concerned about what I'm doing and what I'm not doing when I realize that I'm not sure if this action is accurate or is correct or it isn't correct, I will follow up and try to figure out if it is or it isn't. If I'm not as concerned, if I'm not as careful, then I'm not going to be as concerned with checking. And that's what we are seeing. That is something that we have a lot of trouble with. Meaning we're not seeing enough follow-up on the specifics of our behavior, what is right, what is wrong, and to try to actually see what God says is right and what God says is wrong. Especially when it comes to our relationships. Especially when it comes to our relationships. There are certain responsibilities that we have towards others around us, family members, different family members, in the context of our immediate family, meaning what I mean by immediate is not parents uh, or siblings, but rather in the context of marriage, our spouse and our children. There's certain uh, responsibilities we have. There's certain things that we are supposed to do, certain things we're not supposed to do. It is clear that we are generally not careful enough to be able to follow up with those and figure out exactly what I'm supposed to do and exactly what I'm supposed to leave, what I'm not supposed to do. Okay. There's a whole lot of that. And we can't address them unless there is a want for them. I mean, we do, we throw things out like just right now, but this is not gonna get you where you, you need them. You are gonna go, each person goes through if they're careful. You go through experiences and you realize you don't know. You realize you don't know what God wants you to do and what He doesn't want you. You hear different things. You say, you think you're supposed to do it a certain way. For instance, in the context of our discussion, your spouse thinks that it should be done in a different way. Well, that should lead to us, okay, which is right? I can't just assume, if I'm careful, again, I can't just assume I'm automatically right. I have to check. So that care should lead to asking questions and I encourage that we try to follow that up. Inshallah. But then leading to the discussion of parenting, after we have discussed that the process of purification or tazkiyah to get to where that child becomes or comes to a point where they have been purified of those elements that they have as children growing up, the ego, the jealousy, the following the desires, trying to get whatever you desire, not caring about others' feelings or other people's rights and so on and so forth, which are all you know, some of the illnesses that we have. If we want to try to do that, we need to know that for the child to get there, the child must be involved with taqwa. The child must be involved with taqwa. In other words, tazkiya is not something that I can do for my child. It's not something that we can do for our children. It's not like, let's say, if I want to give an example to, to compare, there are times where for health reasons, for physical health reasons, parents need to control the diet of their child. You need to control that. So let's say your child has, 
is overweight and the doctor tells you that you need to do something about that, otherwise there's long-term consequences to that. The way you're going to deal with that is probably you will limit the access that your child has to snacks, to different foods. You will make available to them certain foods and make sure they don't have access to certain other foods. And snacks are going to be limited in quantity and the quality of those snacks is going to be different now. Until you achieve that, you see, you start seeing those physical changes in the way your child is in terms of weight and, and what have you, whatever other measures need to be taken. Or if there's some other health issue that you need to deal with. You as a parent can restrict or control the diet of your child and get to the results. The problem with tezkiah is you can't do that. With tezkiah, you can't do that. All right. You can't limit the access of your child to certain behavior or make them do certain things to get to tezkiah even if they don't have access to those things while they are with you and even if they do those other things that you want them to do and they're exactly what you have in the book it's prayer for example it's fasting for example it's reading Qur'an for example the things that they must do and the things that they must not do we've taken away access to everything there's no internet, there's no TV uh, we only communicate with good people, we only allow them to be friends with good people, they don't go to schools where there's not non-Muslims, we may even homeschool them, the environment is completely sanitized spiritually, let's say. 100%. That's still not going to be tezkiah. That's not going to lead to tezkiah. What will lead to tezkiah is your child having taqwa. They need to be careful, not you be careful for the child. They need to be careful. Taqwa is that. That's why we have to establish that principle. Your care for the behavior of your child is fine. We're not saying you shouldn't have that, but look at what you're aiming at, what you need to aim for. What you need to measure if you have accomplished or not. You need to make sure that you have the spirit of taqwa in your child. In other words, you need to make sure they care about their actions. As much as you care, it won't lead to tazkiyah. Yes, again, you do need to take measures in controlling the environment. And I'll explain why that's important. Even if the child doesn't understand. Even if it's not their taqwa. We do need to do that. And yes, we do need to. One of the steps we do need to take is to get them to do certain things. Although they don't want to. And it's not part of them caring for this. And them wanting internally to do it. Yes, that needs to happen too. We're not saying that shouldn't happen. But we're saying that's not enough. That's not the end goal. That's like midway. For ages of 7 to 14, the earlier part of that, that's something that must be done. Why? Because your child shouldn't get without knowing, shouldn't get involved with bad habits, that then will be difficult to avoid when they are careful and understanding and want to be cautious. When you've already developed bad habits, now you want to be careful, there's just so much baggage. It's so difficult to get rid of those. If the parent would have helped that child not develop those habits, not to be addicted to certain bad behavior, it would have been so much easier for this child. Okay. At an age when the child is still not fully understanding, they're not responsible 
yet. They don't feel responsibility. They don't understand what that is. What you need to do is, you as a parent keep the environment sanitized, yes, spiritually. You keep it clean. Not in extreme ways, you don't become a germaphobe <laughs> spiritually. Or some people become that, as I said, they, they remove the TV altogether. No, don't do that. But yeah, don't allow these things to be practiced or it's okay, just have the TV on, whatever comes up, for instance, or other things come in, we're not careful. We buy products and there's imagery on the products that are not appropriate. We just allow it to come in, we don't care. No, do care, but don't be oversensitive about it. Don't be oversensitive. So we do need to do that. Let's get back on track. We need to do that. We do need to keep certain things outside of the home environment. We don't want them around. And when we go out, we do need to try to avoid gatherings, for instance, that wrong things happen in. That needs to be done. In terms of getting our children to see good behavior, see the recitation of the Qur'an, for instance, by parents, see praying by parents, see others praying, like going to the mosque, and also encouraging them, sometimes taking them in a way where it's not too, being too pushy to get them to get involved with prayer, get them to experience that. Okay, that needs to happen. But that's midway. That's not the destination. What you need to get to, when you need, what you need to make sure the child has in them to get to tazkiyah is taqwa, to be responsible, to be careful. They take it seriously for themselves. How do we get the spirit of taqwa in children? How is it possible? How can we get it into that teenager of ours? Before talking about the specifics, there's a few different things that need to happen. And these are... Uh, general guidelines of what needs to happen and it's important that we get those general guide down, guidelines down before that I need to stress and there's no way that I can overdo it I mean, it's whatever, however many times it's mentioned it still is required to be mentioned we need that reminder and that is these things take time they take time the process of training that child to develop these things in the right way takes time and you need to be patient. You need to be very patient. If this is the ex extension of prophethood, which it is, the Prophet says, according to the account that we have, Shayyabatni Surat Hud, the chapter of Hud made me old. And the reason has been mentioned is the verse that says, Fastaqim kama umirt, ma'ak, something along those lines. Uh, you need to be steadfast and persevere on the path, move straight forward, do what is said to you, despite all the difficulties, despite all the odds, whatever comes your way, you need to make sure that you continue to stand and move in the right direction. But وَالَّذِينَ معك, You need to make sure others are with you. You need to make sure they come with you as well. You're responsible for bringing them. That part of it is what made him old. Because there's another chapter in the Quran that tells the Prophet, Fastaghim kama umr. That one doesn't talk about bringing others along. The Prophet says, This made me old. It's very difficult. This is what is going to make you old as a parent. It takes time. You will go through difficult times. You will see that your child doesn't adhere to these teachings. doesn't currently have taqwa, they make mistakes. And people give up. They think they can't do anymore. They, can't, they think they can't fix this. Nothing can be done about it. No, you need to continue. You need to continue. What needs to be done? <clears throat> I will summarize it in... Uh, 
in a couple of words and then see what those entail practically. One is tadakkur, reminders. Reminders on what? Reminders on the principles, reminders about God being there, reminders about the day of judgment, reminders about death, reminders about good things, reminders about what the result of good action is, giving stories of like the Quran does, of great people and how they ended, what they accomplished, where they got, and stories of those who did wrong and where they ended up. The result of good deeds and the result of bad deeds, that's not a practical thing. It's a reminder that we all need to constantly hear. It's a difficult struggle. And the more we hear this, the more we're able to ascend. See, that's the other thing that I hope I'm able to get across. Because we think we are already where we need to be. We're not. It's not like, okay, you get here then, okay, alhamdulillah. No, it's a... It's a path that you keep going. The destination is God. It's never ending. It ends if we decide that it ends. Meaning that we're not going to make any more progress because we didn't decide to make any more progress. If you decide to make more progress, you will have more difficult struggles, more difficult battles to fight. And in order to get those, through those, you need those reminders. All of us need those reminders. And in a sense, when you give those reminders to your child, you are reminding yourself first and foremost. And that's going to help you as well. It's a two-way relationship here. The effect, the benefit of it is twofold. It's a benefit for you and a benefit for them as well. Don't think that you are the one who is benefiting your child. Realize that God is giving you blessings by giving you that child to make you, give you an extra incentive to look at these and give it to them so you can hear it when you're giving it to your child. And look at it in that way. Don't look at the relationship in a way that you are above and they are below and you're trying to take them. No, we need to be humble. Realize that we need God's help. It's a blessing to be able to say the right thing to that child and that will benefit us. We need to look at it in, in that way. So anyway, one is reminders. Reminders on what? I try to explain Reminders on Tawheed, reminders on the Day of Judgment, reminders about death, reminders about you know, stories of nations, of people, where they arrived, doing good, and those who did wrong, where they were, all of that, those are all reminders. And if you look at the Qur'an, you can see how many times God emphasizes and stresses the importance of having reminders. The other thing that we need to do is... Uh, that's one way to word it. Okay. But I want to word it in that way. Or another wording that we have in the Quran is Tawasi. Okay. Tawasi is to advise one another. Now in this case, the parent, because the child is, is developing that stage, uh, you are advising the child, advising to do good, to do the right thing. But again, it's advising to do the right thing. It's saying to the child to do the right thing, not getting the child to actually do it. Okay? If that makes sense. The objective isn't to get the child to do that thing right there and then. The objective is through saying that, whether they do it there and then or not, with the continued repetition of this reminder in an effective way, those words have an impact of the child being reminded and thinking and thinking and then gradually developing the spirit of taqwa within. So you might actually do a few reminders at age 14, let's say, although they are adults, if they don't pray, it's going to be a sin for them, right? But because it's not about that particular time, you might tell them a few times that don't forget your prayer, but you will have to leave them, even though I know that they're not going to pray, okay? Leave them, let them not pray. And then let them afterwards, after the time is up, at some point, not every single time, 
But sometimes, you know, did you make your prayer? If you didn't, it's qadha. And then give them stories. It's when, if you don't take your prayer seriously, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And then leave it again. Leave it. They're not going to make up their prayer. That's okay. You're not trying to get them to necessarily get that prayer down right there. If you get all those prayer down, prayers down, but it's done for you, you not only did you not help them with taqwa, you pushed them away from taqwa. Because their taqwa is being careful of you, not careful of God. What you're trying to instill is the spirit of taqwa, being careful for God, not for the parents, right? So if we see the difference, the words are not trying to get them to do things right there. The continued repetition and reminding and telling, do this for this reason, this is the result, do it. Sometimes yes, with a lot of stress. Sometimes yes, you need to do it, I have to see you. Okay? Not because I need to see them doing the prayer, but because that's how I'm going to make, make them realize how important it is. But it's, if it's an every time thing, it won't have the effect. This is Amr al Maruf al Nahi al Munkar in our religion is this. You may tell a person, just like for, for people who are not our children, they're not even part of our family. If you see someone doing wrong, you should tell them not to do it. If you see someone doing, not doing the right thing, not doing Maruf, you are supposed to tell them to do Maruf. And sometimes you're going to be very uh, straightforward with them, sometimes very blunt, sometimes you're even going to shout it. Especially at governments, at people with power. Okay. Instead of lowering your voice for them, you've got to be louder with them. For an average person, you're going to be less loud. But for a person that has authority, their actions are going to have an impact on multiple numbers of people. Then you're going to be more strong in your language to try to get them to stop the wrong that they're doing or to start doing the right thing that they're not doing. All right, but you may, you may or may not get them to actually start doing the right thing, or for them to stop doing the wrong thing. The important thing in your taklif to keep society clean is for you to say it. That's important, whether they adhere to it, they listen to it or not. The repeated saying of it will naturally make society. Make the environment such that people are not going to feel comfortable doing the wrong thing. And if we don't keep saying it, then people will feel more comfortable over time to do the wrong thing and not do the right thing. It's the repeated saying of these things that has that impact. Even if at that particular moment it doesn't happen, the person doesn't do it. Okay? So for the the child we're trying to instill the spirit of taqwa, the way we're going to do it, the practical step for it is giving reminders of those ideals, giving reminders of people's stories, nations, individuals, of Quranic examples from hadith, the imams, uh, and more contemporary times, great pious people, whether they are ulama or others that we know, we give these examples and also the examples of wrong people, bad people, people who did wrong and where they ended up, as well as Amr al Maruf wa Nahi al Munkar, meaning with regards to actions, specific deeds to do and to do not or to avoid telling them that. That repeated stating of it over time is going to lead to it. So, in summary, our own tazkiya, meaning the child seeing us being careful, we have taqwa. The child sees that. I had access to certain things, I didn't do it. I could have looked at a certain scene, I didn't do it. Okay. I could have said certain things, I was angry, I didn't. The child sees that. That has an impact. Those reminders, again, and reminders on action. Reminders on principles and ideals, reminders on actions. Tadakkur and Amr Maruf wa al Munkar. The combination of those things that are said and our own taqwa and tazkiyah is going to lead to over time, over time, it will lead to the child picking it up. And if you leave out any one of those elements, then you're going to, at least on your part, because whether or not the child develops taqwa, as we said, is not our deed. We have parents who are atheists. I know a, a brother 
whose parents left the Islamic Republic after the revolution because they hated Islam. And they went and settled in Canada. Their child became a very, very strong believer. Okay. And very revolutionary. They tried... I know parents, uh, I have other examples, people who left the Islamic Republic, they didn't hate the revolution, they didn't really care, right? They didn't care, they weren't that religious. But they wanted their children not to be involved in this. They went to California, their children became very involved with it. <laughs> right? It's not up to us, again. We are just trying to do our share. Whether our child develops it or not, we may do everything, the child may not pick it up in the end, as long as we've done our taklif, then Alhamdulillah. And we may not do what we're supposed to do, but the child becomes very muttaqi and very pious person. But it's, the credit doesn't go to us. We didn't do our responsibility. What our responsibility is to help the child in that, our taklif, our area that we can help and assist, is this. If we leave that out, then we haven't done our share. We need to have our own tazkiyah, we need to do tadakkur, and we need to do amr ma'ruf wa nahi al munkar. I think that's in summary what I wanted to share, those general principles. Uh, if there's any specifics, any area that you have in, uh, on your mind that we'd like to, you would like to discuss about how to do some of these things, some of the roadblocks, some of the obstacles, some of the difficulties and troubles we face, um, I think we can do that in the Q&A if we have time for that, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept what was said and what was heard as a worship and ibadah of his inshallah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam please assalamu alaikum um, i've really enjoyed the talks you've been giving there um, really opened my eyes to some of the things very deep thoughts that uh, a lot of food for thought uh, one thing um, i wanted to ask you um, is um, how can i get my children um, to prepare for the arrival of Imam Mahdi, like practical things that I could do. We do certain things, but you know when you do them too often, they become ritualistic rather than um, having the right impact. So are there tips you can give us? or And what is the actual way, like, I don't know, what should we be doing to prepare for him? Yes, part of it is what you're saying, bringing them up to have taqwa. I, like, but apart from that, what can we do? I would say some of the details because you can't have taqwa if you're not worried about the coming of the imam and being involved in it. Right? Taqwa means that. So it's addressing one specific area of taqwa, I would call it. And it's a very important area. And I would encourage all of us to think about that on a regular basis. When it says uh, that we await the coming of the imam day in and day out, that means that this should be on our minds. If it's on our minds, we're going to be thinking about it. We're going to be thinking about whether we're doing it, we're not doing it. What does it mean to do? What exactly do we need to do? All of those things take time for us to process for ourselves. Okay. But I'll ask the question, what is it? Are we prepared ourselves? If we want our children to be prepared, are we prepared ourselves? Do we know what preparation means? There's a couple of thoughts that come to mind. You said certain things, of, if, if they're repeated, they become ritualistic, which is very true. It's very true. I feel sometimes even the du'a for the coming of the imam is sometimes it's a ritual. You know, it's not really asking for the imam to come. Because if you're asking, there's, there's got to be a genuine want desire for the imam to be there but if we're really not concerned about that it's just something that makes me feel good when I do that du'a or it doesn't even have that it's just gotten used to every time we go to mosque that we do this du'a after whichever prayer it is or after every single prayer okay it's there's a danger of that happening but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have them repeated okay we should be concerned 
about it becoming ritualistic. And the only way that we can avoid that is to constantly remind ourselves, keep doing it on a regular basis, but constantly check myself and constantly uh, remind myself that you know, I'm not doing enough. And what does this mean? And so on and so forth. So there are certain things that need to be done in order to keep that uh, remembrance and that at least being mindful of anticipating the coming of the Imam, knowing that he's going to come and uh, you know that whole thought process. There's things that need to happen that we need to do in order to keep that thought alive in us. All of these du'as are for that reason. Okay, the ahadith that we have are for that reason, and so we need to do that. Okay, we need to have even like uh, if our child at an early age they don't even understand the du'a, they memorize du'a al-faraj or the du'a for the health of the twelfth imam. Both of those, Ilahi adum al-bala or Allahumma kulli waliyak or other du'as, du'a al-ahad. Some people uh, memorize, some people do on a regular basis. Uh, do those things. Make sure that is done. Let's not cause the concern of it being ritualistic cause us to not do them on a regular basis. Although, sometimes to avoid the ritualistic aspect, it's okay to let it go, not do it. Let me, and let the child, fe excuse me, feel the absence of that dua. Okay? There's a reason why mustahabat are considered mustahab. They're not treated as wajib. Okay, you're not supposed to always do du'a al-ahad. Like, oh my God, I, I missed it today. No, don't treat it as a wajib. Sometimes miss it. Okay. See what it's like not to say it and then to say it. Okay. it has, uh, so have all of those reminders. That's very important. Why should we have all of those reminders? Now getting to, your, to, to the other part of it. I feel what you're saying is, okay, um, how do we prepare ourselves and our children for the coming of the Imam? What does that exactly mean practically? What type of what needs to be in us that if he comes, we are ready? Okay, I think that's what it is. See, the most important thing, all of the ahadith we have, all of the du'as that we have, they are all reminding us of the coming of the Imam and the objective that he has. And we're told to repeatedly say those things and look into them, remind yourselves of that. Why? Because when you think about those things, you start seeing what you need to do for that coming. Okay? I feel this is difficult for me to explain. I have trouble with it. Because... Uh, we like to hear something specific Like what do I need to do to prepare And the answer that I would like to give is There isn't anything specifically that you need to do Meaning uh, Let's say I don't know Develop a certain skill That when the imam comes I'm going to be making use of that No, you may develop that skill The imam comes you're not going to be of use okay? It's not about that particular skill but what happens is that if you have that constant reminder of the coming and you know what the objective of the Imam is, your objective in life would be to accomplish the objective of the Imam. And then you'll start thinking of what you need to do during your lifespan to get to it. And you'll start realizing what you specifically can do right now, not at a future date. Not at a future time. Not in 20 years. What I can do today to accomplish that. It's a realization that each person needs to come to. Going through the process of constantly thinking. Remembering. An imam is going to come. He has a certain objective. He's moving towards fulfilling that objective. I need to be following him. I need to be fulfilling that as well as a follower of the Imam. I need to be working towards it. The more I think about what that objective is, and I need to currently be moving in that direction, I'll start to realize more and more what I need to do. Okay. What I can do and what I need to do. 
And I think there's a reason why the Imams didn't tell us specifically what you need to do. Because those reminders are going to tell the people of every time, they're going to get them thinking and cause them to realize each of them for their time what they need to do as preparation. Let me remind us of a hadith, hopefully that is going to bring this point home. The hadith says, if you are, rem if you are awaiting the coming of the Imam of your time, then you are in his tent of command. In other words, there's a central, they used to use tents, right, in, in, in war. There's a tent that the commander has, that he would gather his top commanders and he would, they would go over strategy and so on and so forth, then they would go and de uh, deliver. That was called fustat. It says, if you are awaiting the coming of the Imam, you are in the fustat of the Imam. Okay, you might have lived a thousand years ago. And it's taking another thousand years. But if you did your share, you are in the fustat of the Imam. Okay? That means if you are actually awaiting the Imam at your time, which means you're doing the things that you need to do to accomplish the objective of the Imam, at your time, you're in his tent. Whether you see it or not, you actually are there. Okay? But do focus on those things. I recommend in order to get there, we can't have a ritualistic approach. In order to get there, we can't talk about the Imam as this future event that will happen, that all these nice things are going to happen then, and all of that is disconnected from the contemporary times. That understanding, that approach is never going to allow us to be prepared. Read Dua Nudba, through Dua Nudba, the translations of it, you will know what the Imam is trying to accomplish. And when you know that's what he's trying to accomplish, and you're thinking that, okay, we're, it's a process that has already started, we're moving in that direction, that means I need to start working towards those objectives now. That's preparation for the coming of the Imam. Okay? If we can get that in our, in our own heads, straight, straighten that out in our own heads, then we can get that and pass that along. I hope that made sense. I don't know. I, I feel it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to... make sure that I have gotten that point across because it sounds like it's very general and it's not very specific and but you know that's that's as specific as as I can get it the details of it what exactly needs to happen will be very different depending on the person and their abilities their skills their capacity uh, on, on different levels and, and what they need to do but if they have that what I what I just said if they do that they will learn what they need to do Specifically, should we end it? Okay. Recite a salawat, please.